One of humanity's worst habits is that of tribalism, where we pit ourselves against each other based on questionable lines. Of course, this causes conflict, rivalry, and devastating wars and genocides. Call it instinct or social construct or whatever, but tribalism is definitely one thing. Convenient. Tribes form into different collective bodies that vary in nature, depending on who governs it, how, whom they govern, and where. We have different words for these things, nations, empires, tribes, etc. So what exactly are the categories and how should one properly use these terms? These definitions that I will put out for categorizing these bodies may conflict with some real world examples and anthropological concepts. So just note that this is my own construction mostly for the purposes of world building. One distinct aspect of each of these forms of state is that of sovereignty. To be considered sovereign basically means that a state has complete power over itself, as well as the ability to easily and peacefully withdraw from any inter... interstate? International? No. Whatever. Any intergovernmental agreements or treaties. They must also be able to enforce laws over territory and or people. There will also be a difference between people that are naturally citizens of the state and those who are not, which is where tribalism comes into sovereignty. People who are not citizens of the state but are still influenced by it will be oppressed minorities, slaves, or outsiders. I keep using the word state here, but very loosely. I more mean any organization of people with a collective government. This has to apply to territory and or people groups. The state is a very broad and vague category. Just know that people agree to be part of it and that it serves as the idea of the group or the community. This idea started as a part of the state of nature, before any complex social structures were created. The first kind of state is what I call localism. Wait, no, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, clanism. Nope, that sounds incredibly racist. Tribalism. No, I already used that word already. I'm just gonna stick with localism. I'm sure there's an actual word for it, but I couldn't find it. This is the form of state of most tribes and nomadic groups, where the group is largely made up of familial bonds and the leadership is very associated and familiar with the people that they govern. Their territory is oftentimes what is being used and inhabited, meaning that the government is much more focused around the population itself. Clans that are these forms of government oftentimes grow very big, to the point where the bonds of the people and leadership aren't directly familial. So at that point, one could consider these tribes to be a sort of pseudo-country-ish. I'll do nation-states next episode. Stay tuned. Hard left turn into the city-state, which you may be familiar with because of ancient Sumer and Greece, and Renaissance Italy. Most people know that a city-state is just a city that governs itself and maybe the surrounding areas, but this definition can conflict with a few others. The distinguishing characteristic of a city-state is that the city itself dominates everything within its territory. The government needs to be in and focused on the city. Most of the state's economic power, military population, culture, and politics need to be from the city as well. There can be no other population center within its dominion that could potentially rival it in these ways, especially militarily. Lastly, the entire territory must share a common culture or language, or be very similar in these aspects at least. A lot of world powers start off this way, as a city provides a good seat of power, especially if it is situated strategically. But before cities become true empires, they must first become local empires. This is basically an empire that only owns territory that is all the same culturally and linguistically, but there is still a population center to rival the home city. Once it yoinks land from someone that isn't the same as them, culturally or linguistically, it becomes an empire empire. Everyone knows mostly what an empire is because of Rome, Britain, and Star Wars. Empires are where a single state rules over other states that could definitely challenge it. A select few of people groups or territories of its dominions must be prioritized whether it be native empire peopleians only being able to vote, like in a lot of Rome, or conquered people having to pay tribute to the empire, like with the Mongols, or resources and people being taken from the conquered for the sake of the homeland, i.e. England. Empires, being ethnically diverse, must see at least a tiny degree of migration 
and maybe even colonization within its borders, and it must have some policies or aspects of culture that apply and are spread to all of its territory. Empires happen everywhere except for Australia. And I know what you're thinking. But wait. What about... the emus? Don't speak of that. <laughs> Obviously. Usually empires spring up because of a homeland's strategic geography, advantageous power structures or culture, or a specific resource that they have. Now onto the word that world builders and authors love to use without too much thought. Kingdoms. Kingdoms are another type of pseudo-nation state. Mostly. Sometimes they are actual nation states, but let's not worry about that right now usually being culturally homogenous, but the focus of the power comes from the idea that the state is made up by the monarchy, because a kingdom is technically only defined by it being a monarchy. This means that city-states and empires can be kingdoms, but most rulers like to call themselves emperor if they can. But it's not unheard of for an empire to be labeled a kingdom. At the same time, a city-state or local empire can easily be deemed a kingdom as long as it has a king or queen. Kingdoms tend to be dynastic, meaning power is passed from rulers to their children. Usually sons, because why not leave the women out of it? Writers love kingdoms for this very reason. A lot of drama comes out of this. Siblings can vie for the throne. Advisors can place someone incompetent and swayable on it to increase their power. When the next in line is really young and unfit, there becomes a regent who's supposed to be there temporarily, and people can downright replace the royal family with their own. This is some Game of Thrones shit. There's also the question of absolutism versus constitutionality with the monarch. An absolute ruler can do whatever they want as king, and their word is more or less law. A constitutional monarch is checked by a constitution, often handing some power over to a representative assembly usually just representing the rich and the church, in Europe's case. Kings often said that they ruled by divine right, saying that God told me to rule over you and if you ask me to prove it, I'll give you the chance to ask him yourself. There's also the in-between where there's no official representative assembly, but the rich nobles of the realm checked the king's ambitions. This was mostly the case in medieval times, because it worked oh so well with feudalism, a huge amount of European kingdoms were feudalistic. This is a societal structure that's based on classes and loyalty. One is born into their class and cannot move among them very easily. As per medieval Europe, the classes are as follows. Serfs slash peasants, knights, bunch of layers of vassals, and the king. Serfs were the producers of the time. They were to work a specific part of the land and could generally not leave it or switch trades. This sounds awful, but the reason they did it was for protection. The knights were the hereditary warrior class, pretty much like the samurai, and they were the ones that were actually doing the protecting and fighting. They served their own lord who provided them with the means to live and their equipment. They had a code of chivalry that I'm sure you've heard of, and that was... pretty shaky. <laughs> But the greatest dishonor was to break their swear of loyalty to their lord. Most lords had a manor with the surrounding peasant village and a homebrew of knights, but they usually were vassals to an even greater lord. These level 2 lords had their own peasants and knights, but along with those of all of his vassals. This may have continued for a few more steps until it reached the king, the supreme lord. When the king needed a gang to go rough up one of his rival meme lords, remember that the king was often like 14, he'd call on his vassals who would raise armies with their own vassals and march off to war. Of course, there were subclasses within each one, but you get the point. 
A kingdom does not need to have this system in order to be a kingdom, but it is much easier for a hereditary monarchy to rise to power with feudalism because of how familial and rigid the class system was. Also, feudalism kind of sucks. It discourages large-scale trade and promotes no real economic specialization. Also, there's the need for primogeniture, where the eldest son gets the lord's dominion and the others don't get jack shit. But if you split up your holdings among each kid, you get the Holy Roman Empire. Don't be the Holy Roman Empire. I went into so much more depth with kingdoms because they more often follow a specific pattern which results in a very specific kind of state. And of course, each of these definitions has exceptions and would change the categorization of some real life examples. Like you, Holy Roman Empire, you're not an empire. There's also the question of how these things relate when they come together in confederations and pacts and where and when sovereignty is lost. But those questions aren't my problem right now. Stay tuned for part two on Nation States. Hey everyone, I just wanted to thank you for watching. I know my pace on here is pretty slow, but I do enjoy making these videos and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. I really appreciate all the comments and the feedback, the stories and suggestions and you know, the like. Uh, so stay tuned, I'll come out with this next video about nation states soon enough. It is a massive topic to cover with a lot of nuance, as was this one. Uh, I hope I didn't get too much wrong. Uh, if I did, feel free to post it in the comments below. And as always, happy world building.